I think um, I think everyone here probably watched uh, at least some of Sliced or uh, was pretty aware of it. Uh, especially, I think we like well partly because we had gone through the book. Uh, most of the chapters, but we like didn't have meetings on some of those Tuesdays, uh, or all of those Tuesdays. <laughs> I, I don't, yeah, I don't think we ever had one coinciding with it. Um, so, anyways, I, I think the the last episode uh, was August seventeenth uh, between D Rob and Ethan and Douglas, and you know, D Rob ended up coming up uh, on top. Uh, and I kind of like, I know me personally, I try to like learn from him. Um, not only with this, but all the, you know, the Tidy Tuesday screencasts he does as well. Um, I mean, I don't watch all of them. Obviously, that's a lot. But um, it's kind of interesting to see how he just, he has the same thought process, right? He always thinks about uh, the data generating process uh, features um, and really focuses on that, especially, obviously, with, like, Tidy Tuesday and visualizations. He thinks about that, but it's, it's interesting to see how much he really uh, also paid attention to it and was that was a focus uh, for like an ML competition. Um, like he didn't really experiment with a lot of like um, different um, methods beyond XGBoost for basically all the like all the episodes he was on, uh, which is actually really interesting to me because right like he gets more into the feature engineering and thinking about the underlying data and issues with that. And I think that actually really benefited him in this uh, final. Um, episode where uh, the task was to predict, uh, I guess, defaults, uh, the, the size of defaults for loans. Um, so uh, he started out by copy pasting from uh, Kaggle um, the description, the data dictionary. And I guess his interest, like he split it up into these different categories, right, based off like the type of variable. So splitting it up by like regional or categorical, um, small categorical. So I guess, uh, and he notices like some of these have like a lot of categories. So it's potentially something hard to deal with. And I think in some of these cases, right, he didn't even use some of these variables just because there's like so much, so many levels to them. It's, it's always a question of like, should you just like start treating these as numerics after a certain point? Um, but we'll see, I guess I'm wondering uh, in the way he defines this model, how he handles that. Uh, yeah, so a yeah, small categorical like these that are like much closer to what we traditionally think of as factors in our a uh, couple of numeric variables, and then he split it out like numeric money type of variables, which is I guess kind of interesting, um, like distinguishing those two. Uh, but I, get, I think that's good to kind of keep in mind when you're like making visualizations, like oh, right, should I plot one money at a numeric variable versus like a like at, like approval year? Um, so like taking like really having a thought and care into like the when you're even when you're doing something like a numeric versus numeric plot are you doing one versus a money one or are you including two money variables i think that's kind of a interesting thing he did in his process uh so one thing you noticed early on uh was that and i think there's a plot later for this that having a bank uh where that's in the same state as where the loan was guaranteed uh it was like a big deal. Like it, there is, you'll see that the, I think the loan rate or the default rate was much, it was different uh, when it's true and when it's not true. Um, so in Slice, right, for the first 10, 15 minutes, uh, you're not allowed to actually code. So that's why he's like plotting out notes. And that's, I mean, that's what he spent his time doing all this, like categorizing the different features and all that. But he added some things as well, uh, things that, like he, plan to do in terms of VDA. And he does like actually a lot of this. Um, and then there's, I think, uh, yeah, I think he does almost all of the, his EDA notes, but with the model strategy, it like quickly like changes because of like the type of data he has. Uh, so I, I already have everything like loaded in the session. So I won't like step through everything except basically the plots. Um, so yeah, when you're plotting from the train set, you're looking at the default amount, you see, obviously, like, <laughs> this is going to be, like, a very non-traditional problem, unless you're, like, accustomed to working with default and loan data, where you have a very, like, I don't even know if you can call this exactly bimodal, um, but it's, like, clearly there's, like, it's a non-linear distribution here in, in terms of the, the target variable. So something, like, that would be pretty difficult to 
uh, model, at least directly. So, uh, but like, think about this when you're in your like a two hour time frame. you're thinking of like how to plot things for points and sliced and also eventually how you want to model it and get like a properly fitting model. So I think in retrospect, it may be obvious, like maybe you don't want to pick uh, predict this directly, uh, but like well, going through his video is kind of interesting. He didn't actually like change up uh, his target variable uh, until like at least an hour in. Uh, and you'll see like he actually went and changed this, added this line of code, this mutate to make, uh, to look at the percent of approvals that are defaulted, uh, that defaulted. He added this in like an hour later um, after the start and figured he would actually model this um, and then apply a, a scaling factor to, to come up with the like predicted default amount. Um, but yeah, that's like, that was kind of an interesting thing. And I think important uh, going back through like, I don't think, I don't know if any of us would have like known to do this immediately, <laughs> uh, like add a, a percent uh, variable there. Um, so yeah, just going through some more of the plots, I think, and he really did spend a lot of time with the EDA. Uh, and I think that's kind of his, one of the things that really distinguished him from, from other contestants. He not only spent time with it, but also tried to be like, uh, like have it like inform his modeling, which I know I'm guilty of like kind of just doing random plots. <laughs> Um, but yeah, like, I guess a common thing. Uh, so I think this was looking at the default percentage, like, so that percentage variable uh, he created before. This is like the same name. It's a differently named variable for the same percentage. I don't know why he did that, but he's looking at it. I think kind of interesting, and he notes this in his comment here is uh, that like there are some values of greater than one. And like, theoretically, like, should the default not be greater than the approved amount? No, but I guess his his thought maybe is like maybe it's due to interest over time. So I think I think that makes sense, or like that's a decent guess. Uh, so yeah, he just made. I don't know what kind of insight I would get from this. I think he's just trying to look at maybe specific features at this point. Uh, that one I don't get much insight from other than it's got like it's affected by the same thing where uh, you know. Uh, the approval rate, it has like a nonlinear distribution. And so that's uh, plotting a scatter plot with a disbursement, the gross disbursement um, amount also looks very like nonlinear in a sense. Um, yeah. He's looking at the log transformation of approval uh, rate or approval amount. Uh, it also, I think the bandwidth is like really not doing him justice here. Uh, Cause you see like pretty, and maybe this has to do with like how like loans are often like rounded to like thousands or tens of thousands. I think that's what's going on here. Uh, that's kind of interesting to see. Uh, so obviously he didn't come up with these like functions off the top of his head, but he realized immediately after starting to plot some of the categorical variables, which is what he's doing now, um, like state and city, that it'd be helpful. <laughs> Uh, to have functions because he ended up, you know, he's doing his, uh, like, I guess I'll just step through one of these so we can see what it looks like. But uh, yeah, he wanted to make the same kind of plot for various categorical variables. Um, so he, I guess these functions are pretty interesting to me. So maybe the summarized defaults, not all that, you know, strange, you know, it's passing in a data frame, calculating the same things uh, given that data frame. I think it's these other things um, where, he realized he's calling that summarized function always within a different group, right? The, given the categorical column that he passes in, he does a summary uh, function. Uh, but he's also doing this cool thing. Uh, so a factor, the lump factor uh, function, I, I think probably most of us know that, like take a certain number of given levels that you want. So in this case, uh, 15 categories, uh, and then basically condense your data to those 15 levels plus, uh, and then group everything else into some uh, uh, an other level. And you see that here, I think near the bottom in this first plot, there's an other category. Uh, so yeah, that's what he's doing with FCT lump. But the with frequency or with frec, I don't know how you want to say it. Uh, it's kind of an interesting thing to, that he does to create the labels here on the plot. Uh, so he basically takes the, the number uh, in each state, or in this case, the category state, uh, he takes that number and he creates his level, the yeah, the level um, label on the plot. So yeah, that's all it's doing. I, th I think it's a little, maybe a little confusing uh, because I think this is 
yeah, it's like an entire vector of the, like an entire column of the data frame adds a count. And then this is essentially just one row at this point. And then you pull that one row. Uh, so it's an interesting use of like, I don't know if you necessarily needed to fire to do this, but um, except maybe for the first step, but it's kind of a good use case for a deployer functions and then using pool at the end to take out a, like a one element thing. So uh, Tony, yeah, right. I, I got a question for you. Yeah. So with that, that factor lump uh, function, that's pretty similar to something that's in tidy models, right? Like that step other. Yeah. Step other. And so just how do you feel about doing those transformations in recipes versus doing them before? Because if you do them before, like you have more control over like maybe which categories you want grouped in the other or, or something like that. Or like you can use them to plot before you do your, your recipe and stuff versus like actually using the recipe function that's there for it. Yeah. Um, I think, did I hear like Julia say like on some either screencast or something else where she's like kind of opposed to using set mutate for stuff. Like she really? can do stuff beforehand, mm -hmm. uh, especially like in this case where like levels might be have like a different distribution in the test set and you want to like, you know, ensure the same distribution, like, mm -hmm. I don't know, maybe there's like a lot more uh, Massachusetts in the test <laughs> set and that would be captured in other and train, but then it would be its own level in test set. So I think, I think it is good to generally like do some of that uh, beforehand. Um, I don't know, I guess I'm not, I have to think about the specific problem, but yeah. I think in general, yeah, you want to do stuff like stuff like that beforehand. So you know, yeah, I, I, I had this whole this I don't know kick that I was like, would it make sense to kind of use recipes to, like capture, um, you know your data cleaning basically, and Max basically said no, <laughs> oh. <laughs> like, um, because one of the things was that when you're fitting, um. Like when you're doing um, cross folding, the recipes are running repeatedly, mm -hmm. and so if it's something that if it's something that you want to do to everything all the time and it doesn't need any training, do it ahead of time, and then it doesn't have to keep running over and over and over. Which I can see, but I still am intrigued by the idea of using recipes as like just a a thing that you could process to do all of your data transformation. Um, but yet, I guess if Max says it's a bad idea, it's probably a bad idea. Uh, I definitely went down <laughs> that same path because like at some point you want to fit new data on your model and having it saved in the object with your, right. your whole workflow is appealing that way. <laughs> exactly. Um, but they, so that's, you know, Julia was saying the same thing. Of, mm. It's good to split out kind of that the stuff that's just data cleaning and isn't really doesn't have any training to it um there are a lot of recipe steps like that i guess i'd be yeah. interested to hear what the use case for those recipe steps are if, if they're not supposed to be used for that <laughs> i feel like yeah. stuff other could be used for uh if there's like a new level and a factor that yeah. wasn't in the train set I think there's stuff unknown for that. Or, yeah. Or is that novel? One of those two. Yeah. Yeah, that's cool. But that's a case where I think it should be in the recipe. I feel like it should almost be like be defaulted in the recipe. Is there everyone else fit a tidy, like a fit a tidy model and then gotten to the end and you tried on new data and it doesn't work because, yeah, like you left out a step novel or you yeah, left out a okay. impute or something? Yeah. Um, uh, I don't know about you. I started writing stuff like where I just automatically do step impute mean and median, and also yeah. add step to novel, <laughs> just like as safeguards for myself. Which is like an awesome safeguard, but then I, I also have this like worry that okay, well if there is missing data, I I want to know about it. I don't want to just impute something like I've got new data in there and I, I just accidentally imputed something that really should be there. Yeah, you know, I, I go back and forth. If you have enough missing data, you can do, um, was it in forecasts, there's explicit and explicit missing? 
Yeah. Am I supposed to NA? Where it turns it, it turns it from NA logical into the string missing. And then huh. you can use that as a factor level. Huh. Oh, that's cool. So if your data is not missing at random, then you could use that. Thanks. OK. Um, I, I'll continue. <laughs> that was a good tangent. I think that's worth discussing. Um, so for the most part, I don't know how much information he got from these plots. Uh, I think the ones that he did get information from, uh, he'd actually leave a title. So in this case, like looking at sector, um, right, you notice, and I hate the, the super long label, but basically health care is like all the way in the bottom left, meaning like at, indicating that there's a, like less uh, defaults for healthcare and then uh, administrative waste management was in the top right here, um, indicating yeah there was a pretty big um, higher uh, default rate for for that sector. Uh, and then, yeah, I'll just skip the bank and bank state ones. Uh, but here is the part where yeah where he looks at bank state equal state, and he notices right like so for when there is the same state um, level, uh, the default rate is under five percent. But when the bank is in a different state. Um, then there's like a 12 and a half percent default rate. And those are pretty large samples, right? Like one is 38,000 and another is 24,000. Um, I think one thing, he, I don't know why he didn't do this since I see him do this all the time. They didn't add like error bars to this. Yeah, uh, that's what I thought when I first saw this. But I, I'm almost sure like this would probably be like there wouldn't be overlapping error bars with this. Uh, so let's see. Looking at new businesses, there also uh, seem to be at least. So there is NAs that, that we can ignore since there's only 14. Uh, but there's a pretty sizable sample for both new and existing businesses. And I guess this, would, this is one where I'd want to see the error bars because it's maybe like they, those error bars would overlap once existing businesses are at 7% or like 7.5%. And then new businesses are at like, I don't know, like 11 12%. So I don't know if that's like significant or not, but you know, there's clearly a, a gap there. Uh, franchise code, uh, I think his determination here is like it's pretty sparse. Although like at one at the upper end here with this seventeen nine 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 eight uh, franchise code, you no, know, like it's got a thirty percent default <laughs> rate, which is super high. So I don't know, maybe there is some signal there, or you could group those into like some other groups, uh, it would be potentially useful. Uh, I've, I've heard DRAP say sparse categorical variables before, and I, I tried to look it up once, and I, I didn't find what I, what I wanted to. Do you, do you know what he means by very sparse? Yeah, I mean, my interpretation is that it's just like a lot of levels, right? Like if you have over 50 levels in a, in a factor variable. OK. Uh, I don't know if someone else interprets it differently. Uh, yeah. Um, so industry, he left the title for also indicating that maybe it's not all that useful, that it's pretty sparse again. Uh, honestly, I'm not sure what the difference between sector and industry. Okay, a sector, I guess, is larger, larger group than industry. Not really sure. Um, uh, looking at urban versus rural, um, not that big of a difference here. Uh, maybe undefined is meaningful. There is a pretty large sample there, but it's just hard to know what undefined is. Um, and then I think so this part, maybe it would have been obvious. Uh, this is probably the first thing I would have done is a plot by approval year. Um, and you clearly see like, the, you know, around 2008, uh, like a large amount of defaults. Um, and I think he actually got um, golden feature points for this, or at least I think for the golden feature, I have to note both the uh, high default rate and around this period, like the real estate crash, uh, but also like the there was another, I guess there was another rate, like maybe early 2000s, where there was like um, there's another like large economic uh, change going on. I, I don't know, they I actually I don't think he actually got that point. Pointers points for this because he needed to note both of those like 
uh, time periods, but he only noted one. In 2001, it, it was the, the, the dot-com bubble. Okay, okay, yeah. I was, was forgetting that one. Um, plotting by different states, so he was noting here that some states were more affected than others, California, Florida, thing like looking like they were affected the most. Um, and so actually one thing that ED, uh, like that uh, he would do during uh, the sliced episodes is he would pull up the second uh, uh, scripts um, and start doing like more EDA while his model was training. Uh, so in this case, I think, and he noted he wanted to do this in his notes at the beginning, he wanted to do a map visualization. I think, I think he probably thought this was a golden feature. Um, so he did one here showing, right, like what we saw before, Florida, like California amongst the highest. I guess we also see like the lower end of things here, like North uh, Dakota, Montana being like having the least amount of defaults. And I guess again, I think he was going for like a golden feature here. I had to change um, the GG Animate code a little bit because you must have an older version. But like with GG Animate, it, after you do like a transition manual, um, you get like these special variable names that you can use. So current frame um, is what like one of the special reserved keywords. And I think in his version, you have to use like the same name variable. So he was using approval fiscal year uh, in this like bracketed thing here. Um, so yeah, I, I, he noted that this is not like the most insightful thing. I think if you do it, if you um, color relative to year, then you get more insight, but because there's just like less defaults um, in like the 1990s compared to the 2000s, you just get it, like a lot of purple early on. <laughs> um, so I think you're just going for points here, but that's kind of, you know, it, it's just kind of impressive, right? To have like two things open, like thinking, oh, let me make a plot here while I'm also training my extra boost model. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. Okay, one, one can aspire to that level, but uh, I will just observe and admire for now. Uh, so this, I think it's just more time series. I don't think he really spent too much time on this. This is um, similar to combinations of other plots he made. Um, and I don't think he got much insight from these other two, uh, several of these plots. So I'm not gonna go over those. Um, so back to modeling, he like copy pasted his own um, like notes from uh, above. And so I'll just take those out right here. Um, one thing I noticed is, is you, you would use like a small like number of folds for cross validation. I think that was mostly just to speed up training. I don't think there was anything more to that. Um, and right, like, so here's his like magic workflow and he's like, I don't know, a maniac and didn't step and didn't separate this into like multiple variables. He just like does the recipe, passes that into the workflow and uh, adds the set engine and, and all that. Um, I think at the time workflows wasn't supporting like being able to pass both like the preprocessor or this, uh, yeah, what is this? Like, um, like the engine parameter uh, and like yeah, the preprocessor parameter and like the engine parameter, but um, I think, I think he had installed like the dev version at the time and was able to do that. That might be like updated now such that you can, this is like, you can do this now. Um, but yeah, I, I still think he's crazy for like formatting his <laughs> recipe and workflow like this. Um, one thing I noticed about him is he'll like, uh, actually type out the formula, which is, I guess he's thinking through every variable, right? As he's adding it and like. I, I know I get and like I get tempted to always just be like target variable uh, and then put every other variable on the right hand side by like you know using the dot just assuming okay every, just put everything into the model. But even with his first model, he starts like I think he started with you know three or four variables um, and was like you know very careful about it, right? He like typed out each variable, thinking about each of them. Um, Especially because he created a variable that was similar to the outcome, right? How easy would it be to go back to the first step? Yeah. Add like that ratio defaulted or whatever it was. Yeah, like if you included up, yeah. default and not in here, then you have like a ton of like what you, yeah. you get an overfit model. Um, so yeah, that's, and he, does, he I'm pretty sure he did that every episode. It's just his 
uh, method, but it's, it's something subtle, but I think it's like interesting to note. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't know why he's doing the PMIN on the franchise code. I think he saw that there was a franchise code one um, that had like a lot of samples. And so he's probably just trying to extract that and treat that, treat this almost like as a FCT lump where he's like, okay, if it's a franchise code one, it's, it's one level. And if it's not, if it's any other franchise, it's another level. Um, let me go back to that plot just to confirm that. There was a question in the chat when you're, when you're done looking at that, I can read it. Yeah, sure. Uh, curious if the test set is a random sample or is it a segment time? Uh, yeah, that's a good question. Um, Okay. I know there are some like functions. I'm just looking at the fraction by year. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, like 12% is like the max in both in 2005 and 2006 are the most. So yeah, I guess it is a random sample by year. Um, yeah, I'm wondering if that would, that's really the best thing to do. I, I don't know what their thought process was for doing that. Because um, right, like when you're doing like a time series time of model, I guess traditionally like the holdout sets like the future set. Um, yeah, so this is a franchise code one right in the middle here. Uh, and I think that's why he was doing PMIN uh, and looking at if it's less than two, uh, then basically create a feature for franchise code one and then everything else is grouped together. Um, I don't know if that's like super helpful. I think he does a feature importance plot later, so we can look at that in a second. Um, so I guess a big thing to note here is is like objective. Right, what is this pseudo Huber Hue error thing? Uh, I know I had to look this up myself. Maybe if you do like financial modeling, maybe you've used this before, but essentially it's like this like uh, middle ground between mean squared error and mean absolute error, which is uh, so it's particularly good for capturing like the pros of each of those um, uh, of those evaluation metrics. So like Mean squared error, if I remember, is like, you know, particularly good for like penalizing for outliers or mean absolute errors, like uh, doesn't care quite as much about outliers. And then like pseudo hue error is like somewhere in between there. So I think his thought process was like, there's like these two extremes in the data set. Um, we do sort of care because like on one end of things, like you got these super large loans that are on one extreme. Um, so we do care about getting those right, especially because like they're large numbers. So the, like the larger you're off, if you're predicting near zero all the time, and yeah, maybe it's near, it's it's like, you know, 99% of the data is like not in default, then yeah, you're, you're getting close all those times, but you know, like there's a $100,000 default. Uh, you just like, <laughs> you lose a lot, a lot of um, uh, magnitude there, I guess. Um, so I think that was the thought process, get some compromise between mean absolute error, and mean squared error. Uh, ultimately, um, I think the evaluation metric was mean absolute error. Um, but he figured like doing something in between mean squared error and mean absolute error would ultimately re result in like the best model for the competition. Um, I, so the funny thing is I think uh, slice season zero, so the the season, like the prep season for this, they also had like a default to data set for the, the championship round and both contestants also used pseudo hue bearer. So I think that's like kind of a known thing for like modeling defaults. Um, I don't quite fully understand it, um, but that's what I learned from about five minutes of Googling. Um, so yeah, he, uh, well, the other thing about DRAV, right, and I mentioned this before, he doesn't really mess around with different methods. He just sticks with XGBoost. And he's also pretty specific when he's looking at his hyperparameters. So, and you'll see this with the other episodes, he like almost always just looks at trees and then try. Uh, I, I think every once in a while I look at a third parameter, um, like the number of, what is it, like the node size is maybe the third parameter he'll look at. 
So yeah, he's very specific about it because he wants to be able to get like really interpretable insight from his data. And I guess at this final point here, I think he must have been trying like other things too. Um, but he he must have like really decided M try for is like the best thing, uh, and then was really just evaluating trees at the end. Um, but yeah, he like really hones in on parameters. So that that's another thing that really distinguished him. Uh, I think compared to like other competitors. Uh, he's doing like the traditional, you know, like the best practices for tracking your your fit. Um, notice he's like training on only like the largest uh, defaults here. Uh, so that's why it, so it's a variable called train highest. And he created a, a little earlier um, arranging the train set by um, what is it, approved amount and looking at just the top 30,000. I think there was like 60,000 records or so in the train set. Uh, so this is yet another way of like speeding up training, right? You know, taking just a half of the data there. And yeah, that's kind of interesting to see how he's just, he's like sorting by like uh, the approval amount, feeling like he's going to get, uh, like it's it's most important to get those, right? Like the, the ones with the highest approval amount. Um, so let's see, throughout this process, and you, like, I guess I'll point out this note here. He was comparing often to like, what was the mean absolute error of just predicting all zeros? It's about 14,945. And I would, I think up until like an hour and 45 minutes into like him working, he was not able to beat this number, <laughs> which is kind of funny. Um, just to like speak to the difficulty of the data set. Um, and I didn't like, you know, watch meticulously enough to see exactly what finally tipped him over the edge. But, um, you know, he set up this, basically this post-processing to his model. So recall his models to predict percent, uh, the percent, like the ratio, I guess, of um, approvals to default. Um, and then he figured out, uh, or he thought through this and thought, okay, I need to think about um, a threshold and like how much to multiply. So the threshold being like, Oh, you know, like think of this almost as like a logistic regression. Like we want to play around with that threshold between um, one and zero. Uh, I don't know what why he tried just between zero and 0.6. I guess maybe he could have tried between zero and one. Um, I think probably just uh, prior uh, understanding or looking at the data. He's like, okay, let me try a grid of values between zero and 0 0.6 in terms of threshold, uh, in terms of like, am I going to pre predict that this is a default or not? And then you know, looking if that threshold's one, apply a weight uh, zero to 0.4, or in, like trying uh, like a grid of values across that, and looking at what ends up giving me like the close, like the the smallest mean absolute error. So uh, I guess this is probably easiest to look at, um, yeah, in the table. So I guess the combination of a threshold weight and like arranging by estimate. Okay. So looking at a threshold of 0.4 um, in terms of like zero or one classifying this as a default or not, that ended up being the best combined with uh, multiplying the actual predicted value by 0.4 uh, uh, to come up with like the final prediction in terms of like how much was, how much is the person defaulting. Um, so he has like a plot for this. That I think it's pretty good, this I think. So actually looking at the combination of those two variables, um, thresholds on the x-axis, so value between zero and six, and then weights shown as a hue, uh, you see like as threshold increases, uh, as weight uh, yeah, as weight is smaller, at least in, in like the initial values of threshold, like the lower values of threshold, lower weights were also better. Uh, but So I zoom in here to thresholds greater than 0.3, and you can see like, um, looks like the combination, right, of a 0.4 threshold and a 0.4 weight has the lowest mean absolute error. Um, so this, I think that was a pretty clever approach by him to kind of like, yeah, do predict percent um, and then do some post-processing to come up with, okay, given a percent prediction, um, what is like the on-off switch, what value, what threshold value should I use for the on-off, zero or one? And then what like weighting should I apply to that? If it's one, um, 
apply the like multiply by the weighting to come up with like an actual predicted default number. Um, so yeah, that's pretty interesting. Like post processing, this is like not even modeling, right? It's just looking at the post processing of the model. Is is the weighting here? Is he doing that because he had only selected those larger deals before? And so this like weighting here is kind of offsetting the based off you know the, the the chance of those things defaulting. Is that kind of what like what why that's useful here at the end? Yeah, I, I think I think so. Like right, so threshold as I understand is the on off switch zero one, and then weight. Um, so this actually kind of feels wrong. I, maybe I'm not reading close enough into this. Yeah. Okay. So he's multiplying it by approved amount, the initial approved amount. Uh, to come up with it. Yeah, I was thinking for a second he was only multiplying the zero to one number by weight, which would have made no sense because it would just be an even smaller number, but he's multiplying the weight by the initial approved amount. So like say if it's 100,000, weight's 0.4, so 40,000, um, and then if it's one or zero, uh, multiply by one if it's if he's predict it's predicted above the threshold. So yeah. Gotcha, I think, gotcha. Yeah, yeah, so I think yeah, it's a really clever way. He, he like understanding that there's like a uh, sum of a, there is a relationship between like you know the uh, the default amount and the original approved amount, um, but nonlinear in a sense. So you had to you know play with the thresholds and weight values to come up with um, with like the proper a good prediction. Uh, so I think that's about I think that's about it. Uh, most of the other stuff are kind of already. Oh, we have the importances plot. Um, so he was weird and was doing stuff out of order. Um, or he, I think he did this like around, you know, an hour in and then just moved this down lower uh, into in his RMD. So like he was even thinking of like formatting his RMD in terms of like what your normal process would be uh, looking at feature importances like, like near the end uh, after the modeling. Although in reality, he was doing this like he was plotting this uh, after his initial like smaller model. Uh, so it's kind of, yeah, it's kind of cool to see how he's like formatting the document as he's going. Um, so I think, uh, so approval fiscal year, uh, maybe not surprisingly comes up as the most important. And we, you know, that makes sense, right? Like we saw between 2005 and 2009, like we, there was just a larger um, default rate. So yeah, not, not all that's weird. Uh, SBA, I guess, is like a default or like a credit union or like, I don't know, like some national credit company. So their approval, like, I think, uh, I think this is a numeric variable. Their approval uh, on uh, the original default was an important feature. Uh, and then I think most of the rest of this is like not, I don't know, it's, it's kind of like marginal feature importance, honestly. Um, I see it, like see the same state variable came up uh, fifth year. So maybe that was a good thing to add. And the new exist variable came up last year. So maybe that wasn't as important um, as you originally thought it would be. Um, I was say from the last chart, it looked like the weighting maybe should have been higher than 0.4. If you just, if you look at the last chart. Yeah, but so what was it? So you think in, Right, or oh, this is just his estimate, or is this his error that he's measuring here? Yeah, he's measuring his error on the y-axis and the weighting right, is shown as a color here. Uh, although this does make me think, right, so he limited the weighting, so he limited the weighting range to 0 and 0.4. So when typically when you come on like one of your optimal values at the very end, edge of your range, that'd make me think like he might've been better off like trying even like a larger yeah. range here. Yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah, okay. Yeah, I think I was on the same page as you. I was just like <laughs> taking a step back there. Um, yeah, I'm wondering if I yeah, rerun this, make it 0.8. Um, yeah, 0.8 is like the best weighting. So what if we did like, what if we did like two? How much that would show up as like the best? So I guess he potentially left points on the table here. So 0. 0.45 and 0. 0.85 would have been uh, the best. So we Threshold, see- Threshold, but his, yeah, his weighting like 0. 0.85, 0. 0.8. Yeah, so what if I like try this? Uh, I'll, yeah, I'll do that. Um, maybe I'll, I can upload this and see if this works. Um, yeah, attempt two here. Uh, 
Yeah, I think this is off screen for y'all. I don't know if you're seeing it. But... So this comes up with a much worse score. <laughs> okay, maybe that wasn't great. Uh, yeah, it comes up with like an RMSC of like 30,000, which is much higher. Uh, or what is it? Not RMSC, uh, mean absolute error. That's weird. That's weird how it's like so. Did I do the right thing? Yeah, that, so we when we re-ran re this with a higher weight range up to two, we get 0.45, which is the same thing as before, but like a new weight of 0.85 is like the best in terms of uh, minimizing mean absolute error. But then when I upload it, it gets, <laughs> on the holdout set, it's much worse. Uh, that's weird. I, I don't know what to say there. Uh, that was worth a shot though. Uh, I think the rest of those besides the importance is, yeah, no, it's just, I'm not sure what he was doing here. <laughs> so this was his, uh, yeah, this was his zero submission. So he submitted this early on just to get something on the board. And that was his baseline for a while. Um, and then just some notes to himself, some things he's already noted before. I, I noticed him doing this, he would like copy paste some of the same stuff in different places. So maybe he wasn't as structured as I as I was giving him credit for, because uh, he had this in his notes at the top to map by state. Uh, okay, yeah, I think that that's it. Uh, he didn't end up getting to stacks and text recipes, which he imported at the beginning. Uh, he had a note about uh, potentially joining on the zip code database, uh, to get, like with population density and all that. Um, yeah, but he got <laughs> just didn't have time to do that. And he didn't get time to uh, to use stacks there. Uh, but yeah, if you're looking back at his model strategy, talking about looking at the high cardinality categorical features, he did some stuff with that, like especially with like the franchise code and looking at same state or different state. Um, but you know, it didn't end up doing too much with those features there. Yeah, and that's I think that's it. Uh, he ended up winning by a pretty small margin. You would know any of the the variables that he used that that Ethan didn't use, do you? Uh, I don't know. Yeah, I actually, yeah, Ethan, like, you know, didn't post his um, oh, yeah. video. Like that that same state one seems like it'd be a small but important one that might, like like even something like that might be enough to win you. Yeah, um, I agree. Like I think that's he. Like B Rob throughout the whole competition emphasized like coming up with like new features more so than like um, using like cat boost, right? Which could have like slight improvements over XG boost. Uh, but that is, it's like more like black boxy and you're just kind of hoping it's slightly better. But like you can, you know, you can do better if you like actually feature engineer better. Uh, you didn't really do a ton of feature engineering here though, just those couple things. But I think that was about all he needed to do. <laughs> Uh, because it was like the margin was so close at the end. I think it was it was like less than a hundred in terms of like uh, mean absolute error that was the difference. Did uh, the features that he created show up on the important spot? Yeah, yeah, the fifth one, and then like the I guess the tenth one. Uh, let's see. The same state one here, mm. uh, and I guess new exist as well as the tenth one there. It was new existor. Oh, no, new, no, uh, I was trying to... Yeah, there's another one too, right? Um, oh, urban, rural, or unknown, right? There was an unknown. Urban, rural, yeah. But there was an unknown category as well that was that was actually pretty important. Yeah, yeah. Where was that? And and what's not going to show up on the the importance plot is like like Tony said a lot modeling the percentage and then using that as a multiplier on the, the loan amount. Mm. You guys have any other ideas for for features that maybe you would use after after walking through his code like this or I think he could have done something with the state. Like I think Florida and California are being so high up in terms of uh, let's see Florida for sure. I don't know. That's my thought. 
could have done something with that. I wonder if he, yeah, if he did join on that zip code package, then maybe you could look at like within state differences in population density. So like, I'm I'm guessing that the the defaults in Florida are clustered around high density areas, like high property values. Yeah. So like if you're around Miami or St. Petersburg or Tampa, like so maybe you could do like a flag. Is this a good in the top N of population density or not? Create a create a beach flag. <laughs> yeah, it a beach flag? <laughs> it's on a beach or not? <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I think real that. estate was actually like the third in this sector plot. Uh, real estate and rental and leasing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this was like. I think this was definitely uh, like amongst the hardest ones to like in the whole competition. Um, yeah, I think that's why they left it for last. Yeah, I think, I mean, I think that um, the point about figuring out the threshold and weight was important. I'm not sure then given that if it sub doing something more with scaling so that you're like the predictions would line up pretty close with what the actual probabilities were for figuring those out may also been helpful, but I mean, he did that kind of gets at that a little bit there with that check visit at the end, but something, some kind of like plot scaling or something like that. Yeah. 